uh, Wednesday night, we had service, and, I, and before service, during the day, I was reading my Bible, and this worship song came on, and it was Isaiah 43, 19. It, well, it, doesn't, it didn't say it. It just said, Behold, I do a new thing. It was this song that came on like a soaking worship song. I was like, oh, I've never heard that before. And I heard it, and then I was reading Isaiah chapter 43 as it was on, and I was reading, as I was reading through, I came across Isaiah 43, 19, Behold, I do a new thing, which was pretty cool as I'm listening to the song. It wasn't an accident. It's the Lord. Amen. So I shared that Wednesday night. That was, that was kind of neat. But the other thing I saw, which I normally don't do, um, is on YouTube is look at comments. But I was just, I'll be worshiping, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll listen to worship music, and this song came on that I've never really heard before, Behold, I Do a New Thing. It's not even a song. It's more like just like instrumental worship. And, uh, but I, a comment popped up, and I read a couple comments, and I felt led to share these with you, and I'm going to share them with you right now. Are you ready? Okay. My husband asked to see our kids for the last time. This is just a comment on the song. Because he knew he was dying. But Jesus wrapped his love around us. He is now healed. How can I forget what Jesus has done? Amen. Isn't that awesome? I love hearing the testimonies of Jesus and what he does in people's lives. Here's another comment that I read as this was on. I suffered from infertility. Tried for so many years to get pregnant. I was I always prayed to God to please bless me with a child. I was watching a mother play with her son on TikTok one day. I cried and screamed to God, God, please give me a child. That same day, something in me told me to take a pregnancy test. It came back positive. I couldn't believe it. I was in tears and in shock. I took more pregnancy tests, and they all came back positive. A week after I found out I was pregnant, I found a cross necklace a few steps away from where I worked, at, and I, I then knew it was really God all along and never left my side. I now have an 11-month-old, healthy, beautiful baby boy. He's turning one in a few days. God is good. Yeah. Amen. Isn't that good? We serve a God of miracles. I love hearing testimonies. And when you hear it, don't have an orphan spirit where, oh, why does God do that for them and not me? He is your father too. He's no respecter of persons. What God has done for others, he will do for you. We meet him in faith. And Revelation chapter 19, verse 10 says, a testimony of Jesus. In other words, talking about, speaking about what Jesus has done is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, when you hear a testimony of what Jesus has done, you can say, I take that word for myself. Are you with me? An example and we had a guest speaker back in September. He was, the Lord showed him that there was someone with, uh, I think, hip or sciatic pain over here. And um, the Lord told him that. And he said, there's someone over here, and it's you. And, and prayed for the guy. The guy was healed. But then the next week, someone came to me and said, as he said that word and prayed for them, the person next to me said, that word's in the air, that testimony, grab it. And she said, I took it, and I got completely healed. You can grab it by faith. You can grab a hold by faith of the testimony of Jesus when, when it's shared. And uh, our God is a God of miracles. He is not dead, but alive. He's like no other God. Amen. Amen. He's not Buddha. He's not Mohammed. He's not dead. He conquered the grave and he's alive. (laughs) Hallelujah. Jesus Christ. Well, there's many ways. There's not many ways. Well, Jesus can be one way. He's a nice guy. No, a nice guy doesn't lie. And he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the father, but by me. It's faith in Jesus Christ. And for me to tell you anything different would be a lie. And would it be, I would be held responsible for God for allowing you to go to hell. Jesus Christ is the way. And when you have faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross, that is what brings salvation to mankind. You can't be good enough. You can't be perfect enough. You can try on your own and you'll fail miserably. But when you put faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross, he didn't fail miserably. He succeeded and he won victory. And on top of it, he made a spectacle triumphing over the devil. Hallelujah. We're on the winning team. It's like the Niners in the Super Bowl. (laughs) Don't get mad at me. (laughs) Hallelujah. I believe in miracles. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what we have written back there because the same Jesus that was healing people, is still alive today, and he still heals people today. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The gospel has not changed. People can get fancy. They can try and do different things. Generations can fall away from the Lord. They can be back with the Lord. What people think nowadays in our world is way different than 10 years ago. They think you're crazy if you're thinking what you were 10 years ago. They're the ones that went crazy. 
The gospel has not changed. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. Praise God. I love, you know, we're doing, my dad last week went through the first miracle of the book of John. And we're doing a series on the seven miracles in the book of John. So we're on the second miracle this week. I love miracles. I love, you know why? Because Jesus loves people. Miracles are great and the signs are great, but they're really a release. They're a manifestation of his love and compassion for people. Wherever Jesus Christ went, he was moved with compassion. Yes, he multiplied the bread, but not for the sake of a sign, but because he was moved with compassion. He would do great miracles, signs and wonders because he was moved with compassion. And when you preach the word of God, he will accompany it with miracles, signs, and wonders that point to him. I I, I always, when I think of miracles, I can't but hardly think of Catherine Kuhlman. I believe in miracles, for I believe in God. Do you believe in miracles? By the Holy Spirit. Sometimes I let my kids watch videos of miracles because I want them to see it and know it's normal. It's normal. And sometimes we can forget. And when I hear some of the stories with Catherine Kuhlman, it's amazing. The miracles that you would see. A guy that fell out of an airplane and perished in an open and was in a complete stretcher and gets hit with the power of God and the buckles unbuckle and he gets up and is healed from being paralyzed. I could go story after story after story of amazing, amazing supernatural things that weren't just for Catherine Kuhlman, they weren't just for the time of Jesus, and they weren't just for the apostles. They're for me and you. Jesus Christ is same yesterday, today, and forever. And let me tell you something. Jesus Christ was doing miracles, but he died on the cross. Why did he die on the cross? He died on the cross, yes, for your salvation, but much more than that. He was doing miracles and healings, but he died on the cross to make the way so he could do miracles and healings through your hands. That's the power of the cross of Jesus Christ. So it's not just him in one place on earth, but you anointed by the Holy Spirit going about doing good, just like he did, Acts 10, 38. He was anointed going about doing good, healing all who were oppressed. By who? By the devil. And God's desire and will, he, Jesus paid the price on the cross so that you could go and continue the book of Acts and you can walk in the acts of God anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you might go, well, I've messed up. I don't feel qualified. Paul was killing Christians. Not sure what you've done, but that's not very a good thing in my book. Okay? And God used him tremendously. So let's go to John chapter 4. So... Before Jesus comes to Cana, and the interesting thing is, if you noticed last week, when Pastor Fred was preaching, he talked about the miracle done in Cana. And that was the first one, the first sign, miracle done there. The second is in John 4, but he wasn't just in Cana only, although this one was also done in Cana. And you've got to wonder, why are things happening in Cana? And in verse 43, before you read about this in 46 through 54, in verse 43 of John chapter 4, It says, now after two days, he departed from there and went to Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him. So they received him, having seen all things he did in Jerusalem at the feast. So before he goes here, he he actually goes to his hometown. And that's in Matthew Chapter 13. In verse 53, now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? So they're going, wow, look at this man. This is great. Where, Where did he get this from? And then in verse 55, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not this his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? 
So they were offended at him. Why? Why were they offended at him? Familiarity. 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 But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his honor except in his own country and his own house. And he did not do mighty works there because of their unbelief. We need faith. Amen. Amen. And what can happen is when you become familiar with someone or something, that familiarity is connection connected with unbelief. See, someone might go, and I've experienced this when I go to different places. I could go to a, a school, like I've said before, I went to Mount Union, and they'd won seven national championships in football, great program, and I was there, and everybody's like, what are you doing here? This is just Mount Union. And then I go to a Pac-12 school, University of Arizona. Oh, you're just going over to the U? I mean, you could go anywhere, and people just go, oh, just because they become familiar. They don't honor it and value what they have around them. Someone could be a very great person, but they're around them every day, and they, just, they don't value. When you value what God has put on someone's life and what each person has around you, and you honor that, it allows you to receive from what they have. So when you honor a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. If you don't honor that prophet, you won't receive that prophet's reward. Are you guys understand what I'm saying? And there might be someone who walks in healing ministry. You go, I don't really like that. Okay, then you're probably going to have trouble receiving that from God. Oh, I don't like, I don't, I don't like that people want to teach people how to get out of debt and people to walk free financially and that God wants us to prosper. Fine, stay miserable and unprosperous. Go ahead, criticize them all up, down, and day, and you're going to stay right where you are. And even in his own town, God had to shut it down because God has kingdom principles. And when you don't walk in honor and you don't walk in faith, God cannot violate his word and work against his word. Are you with me? And God works by faith, not by fear and not by dishonor. So now he comes into Cana, and you can see they received him. Can you say receive? having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also had gone to the feast. So Jesus came again to Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And you don't think people were talking about that there? You don't think that testimony is going around and building people's faith? When you hear the word, it builds your faith. When you hear the word of God or the testimony of Jesus and the word of God for the era you're believing, it builds your faith to receive from God. And so they're hearing this story, I'm sure, about at the wedding, the miracle he did the week before. And, and there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he went to him and implored him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then Jesus said to him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will by no means believe. So he's here. He's at a point where it's a scary situation. He's coming to the Lord and he's saying, Jesus, come down. You know, he, he's believing because, you know, he, he had heard and it's starting, the faith is starting to come, but he wants Jesus to do it a certain way. You ever want God to do something you're asking for, but in the way you ask for it? It's got to be done this way or do that. Hey, I need you to come down. I need you to do it this way and have it done. And I need to see this. I need to see you come. If I see the sign of you touching him or you raising him or the, you working this miracle, then I'll believe and this will happen, right? So he's, he's, he's telling him to come down. Jesus says, unless you guys see signs, wonders, you'll by no means believe. And I don't want to get um, too far off on it, but signs, signs and wonders are to point us to God. They're just a direction to what we're to seek out, who we're to seek out. Are you with me? I love seeing signs. I love seeing wonders. I love seeing miracles. But we don't worship them. We worship the Lord, and they're to point us to the Lord. If you think about it, well, I'll get into that in a minute. <laughs> so John 4, you'll believe. You'll by no means believe. The no man said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. But Jesus did something different. He didn't go down. He said to him, go your way, your son lives. So Jesus spoke the word. What did he do? He spoke the word, and the man believed. Now, there's a lot of ways you can receive miracles. A lot of ways healings can be done. You can have, you know, the presence of God when you're worshiping, and an atmosphere of the glory of God, and people are worshiping, and someone receives their miracle. God becomes more real to them to their problem. 
Or as they're worshiping, God begins to touch their heart and break hardness off or, or release, they start releasing what they held bitterness against someone and they're worshiping, God touches their heart and they let it go in the forgiveness and then all of a sudden an arthritis or something leaves their body. God can heal that way. You can have people get healed when you're in a meeting and there's corporate faith. The person that got healed might go, I wasn't even believing, I didn't even know. But there was a bunch of people in there praying and believing for God to work and you can believe for other people. You can go to a brand new believer and pray for them to be healed or experience something, and you can operate in your faith, and God will allow you while they're babies to help them walk. But then there becomes a point where we got to grow up ourselves in our own faith and walk and believe for ourselves. You can be healed by the, the gifts of the Spirit, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit and laying on of hands. People can get healed when you pray and you remove a spirit that's been operating in their life, like a spirit of affliction. There's a lot of different ways Communion is a powerful way to be healed. But let me tell you something that works 24-7, and it's the word of God. It doesn't return void. And it's important to have the word of God in you and become more real to you than the life you live. We walk by faith, not by The devil will try his hardest to get you into how you feel and what you see. And he'll want you to focus on it all the time. Do you see this? Do you feel this? Do you see this? Do you feel this? And he'll try and get you. But when you get him into the word of God and in faith and in the spirit realm, you'll whoop his butt all day. And that's the realm we got to cross over and enter into where it becomes more real. How does it become more real to you? You spend time. That's a price. You spend time in the word. You spend time in prayer. You spend time loving the Lord and spending time with him. And as you do that, he becomes real and the word becomes more real than the natural. And so he hears the word. And you guys can hear the word go forth today. You can hear the word when you're praying and worshiping. God will speak a word to you. Or you're reading your Bible and a verse jumps off the page and he spoke to you. you ever had that happen? But look, when you're doing that, you're positioning. That doesn't happen to me. Are you positioning yourself daily in the word for him to speak to you? And all of a sudden a verse or God will speak something as you're worshiping. And don't ever doubt in the flesh later what God spoke to you in the spirit. And God will speak to you and you hold on to that word. And through that word, that rhema that he spoke to you, faith comes and you begin to believe. And you believe what he said and you hold to that word. And this man heard the word of Jesus. That rhema word, he says, go your way, he's healed. And rather than having to require God to do it a certain way, he said, you gave the word, that's enough, I believe it, I'm going. And then it continues on. The nobleman said to him, sir, come down from my child dies. He said, go your way, your son lives. So the man believed what? What did he believe? The word. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him, and he went his way. And he was now going down, as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Your son lives. They inquired of them the hour when he got better, and they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. So the father knew it was at the same hour in which Jesus said to him, Your son lives. And he himself believed and his whole household. Who? Him and his whole household. So now not only is his son made better, but Jesus comes to sozo. That word healed you'll see in the Bible, it is made whole. Sozo in the Greek, made whole, restored, preserved, protected, delivered. All those good things are in that word. And it's not just for you. It's for you and your whole household. Guess what? Noah found grace in the eyes of God. But guess who got to go in the boat? His whole family because of his faith. Hallelujah. You look at Rahab, she put the scarlet um, ribbon out and, and she, wh whoever was in her house, her household, not just her, even though she was the one that had faith and believed, her whole household was saved. And I want you to believe not just for yourself, but you and your whole household. To give you other scriptures, I don't have time for all of them, but um, I'll give you some scriptures. Acts 16.31 and Acts 16.15. Acts 11.14. Noah is Genesis 6. 8 and 18, and then another one is Joshua 6, 25. That's Rahab, and uh, one of the ones in Acts was the, the jailer. But you can find those instances in the Bible, and this one right here, where him, one person begins to believe, but it's they believe and their whole household. And I want you to believe, and you can stand those scriptures. If you got someone that you are believing to get saved or get back on track with God, take these scriptures and take them before the Lord and pray over them to where they become real to you. And then you begin to speak them. And you start, instead of going, oh, that's, that's my runaway or that's my family way out there, you start saying, that's that person that's on fire for the Lord. Well, you're lying. You're not lying. You're calling those things that be not as though they did. 
Just like God did to Abraham, saying, your father may nations. You begin to speak it. You begin to pray, intercede for them, believe for them. You don't criticize. We don't attack. We need to start praying for people. You know, if we're not praying for the person we're uh, speaking against, we're in sin. We've got to stop speaking against and start praying and believing for them. Amen? And communion is a powerful way to be healed as well. And we're going we're gonna to take communion shortly. And I want to talk about that in just a minute. But when it says at the very end, the last verse, it says, this again is the second sign Jesus did when he had come out of Judea into Galilee. <clears throat> it's the second sign, or the King James Version says, miracle. And like I said, signs and miracles point us to the Lord. I love them, but you know what's greater even than the signs and the miracles is the Lord's heart. Because signs, wonders, and miracles, a sign does what? A person's sign is to point you to something. And <clears throat> the signs point to Jesus. And he's a person of compassion, love, and mercy. The Israelites knew the acts of God, and they saw the great signs, and then they would go and commit adultery and idolatry against God, worshiping a golden calf, saying, this is the God that delivered us. How can you do that? How can you do that? An adulterous generation just seeks after signs. But Moses knew his ways. Because you can even see God's great acts but not know him. It's important that we know his heart. And as you know his heart and you know his love and compassion and you begin to live the life of God for you, walking, anointed by the Spirit of God, in love, a life moved with compassion, God will direct you to the right place at the right time and he'll supernaturally empower you and give you the grace to do what you need to do as you move with compassion. Now, like I said, we're going to take communion today. Miracles happen during communion. Did you know that? We have testimonies of miracles happening in communion. I believe in miracles for I believe in God. You know, early this morning, the Lord was speaking to me about the blood of Jesus and about communion and taking communion and to share some things. I'm wondering, why is he doing this? And I was like, oh, yeah, communion's today. He's reminding me and leading me to do this. You know, I, I heard someone uh, recently talking about how they were, how, you know, Catholics believe that the, 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 the bread is his actual body and the, and the, and the, the wine or the juice is the actual blood of Jesus. And he was taking communion with some Catholics. And he said, they might believe that and I might not. It didn't matter. Jesus was in the room we were taking communion. And he felt the presence of God in there 20 minutes on his knees of the nun as they're both weeping, feeling the presence of the Lord, communing with Jesus. Another time he had been with a, a nun and she was preparing the communion elements and he was on his knees and he felt a robe, an actual physical robe and a leg and opened his eyes up, freaked out, thinking the nun was in front of him and she was over preparing the elements. And he went back to worshiping and he was actually felt the Lord. And I've had some supernatural you know, experience like that where I've felt a hand or different things at different times. But when you take communion, it's powerful. And it's important that we understand because if you don't, you can just walk right over it. And I've heard that Catholics have had a lot of people heal different times as you honor it. And we do too. Because when you honor communion and what Jesus did in you, whenever you remember the power or the moment that happened, you re-release the power of that moment. You know, someone could tell you a sad story to release something sad. If I tell you a testimony of what Jesus did or someone experiencing victory, it releases victory in the room. You re-release that power. When you do communion, you're communing with the Lord, but you're also releasing, you're re releasing the power of the cross in every area that he won through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can apply the blood to your life. The blood of Jesus is powerful, and it's important to have faith and understand what the blood of Jesus Christ does. The blood of Jesus reconciles us. The blood of Jesus cleanses us. The blood of Jesus sanctifies us. The blood, it unites us with the Father. It gives us victory over Satan. There is life through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Then likewise he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry, and according to the law, almost all things are purified or sanctified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there's no remission or deleting of sins. And that word <clears throat> remission in the Greek 
of Ephesus. It signifies a release of bondage and imprisonment, forgiveness. It's a complete release. It's removed. You're forgiven, but it's deleted. It's erased. And also, you're free from bondage through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we have faith in the power of the blood and what it does for us. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things or things that perish, like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You were bought back not by gold or silver, but by the precious blood of the lamb of Jesus Christ. He paid the price. And you don't have to deal with condemnation and guilt. You can tell it to go because of the blood of Jesus. He poured it out. And it pleased the Father for him to do that. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, it talks about that, how it, it pleased the Father. Why? Because he loves you. We don't understand how much he loves us. When Jesus died on the cross, when he poured out his blood for your forgiveness, Isaiah 53, verse 10, it says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. When Jesus went through all of that, and you can read about it in Isaiah 53, it pleased the Lord to do that for you. Isn't that amazing? He loves us. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm just giving you guys some scriptures for the blood and the word of God to build your faith. Because the, the blood opened the grave. The blood of Jesus is powerful. Romans chapter, it's not Romans, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's through the blood of the everlasting covenant, and we have a covenant through the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 9, verse 12. I'm going through, this will be, the, I think, the last scripture. I just want to give you these to build your faith in the blood of Jesus. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with the hands that is not of this creation. I mean, uh, Hebrews 9, verse 12, right now. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For at the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean thing, unclean sanctifies the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The blood of Jesus cleanses your life from dead works, from the old life. It cleanses your conscience to serve Jesus through the blood of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I've messed up, so that makes me excited. I think maybe you guys are all good here. I don't know. The blood of sprinkling. See, the, the, life is, the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. And where is, where is, life, where is that breath of life when God breathes a breath, breath of life? It goes into your blood. Where is, where is air, where is oxygen carried? In your blood. The life is in the blood. And through the blood of Jesus, as he died on the cross and poured out that blood, he did that for you and for me. And it, it removes sin from us. The blood of Jesus speaks better things than Abel. Think about this. God said when Abel was, was, was killed because his brother murdered him, right? And he said, your, the blood of your brother cries out to me. It's speaking to me. It's talking. And where it comes a, a punishment and it's speaking accusation, the blood of Jesus come and it's not speaking accusation. It's coming and speaking righteousness. It's coming and speaking mercy. The blood of Jesus poured out. It's on the mercy seat saying they're righteous. They're forgiven. They're redeemed. So every accusation the devil tries to bring against you, the blood of Jesus is talking. It is speaking better things than Abel. It is speaking that you are righteous. You are made right because of your faith in Jesus Christ. It is speaking saying, no, 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 no. You can't bring that accusation, devil, because I forgave them for that. I poured it out on the cross out of my love and out of my mercy. I poured the blood of Jesus and now it is speaking life. It is speaking righteousness to the people of God who believe it's the righteousness of faith and it's faith in what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Amen. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus on the mercy seat 
speaking. Don't let those thoughts from the devil try and come at you. How could you? You this, you that. No. You, you get the word of God in you and you start speaking the word of God. Understand that you were made righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ and what he did for you. It's a good old fashioned gospel. Well, this person's dealing with this and we need the 50 pills and a counselor and this and that. The gospel of Jesus Christ still works. And it's better than some government aid. You got heaven's aid. Jesus paid it for free for you. It was a high cost, but it was paid. You just receive it by faith. Praise God. Jesus is the way. He is the answer to every problem in our society. You can debate all day. You can go on the news all day. You can listen to the news all day. The answer is in the good news of Jesus Christ. If you came frustrated, if you came down, if you came feeling discouraged, there's one answer and it's in Jesus Christ. And as you put your faith in him and your trust in him and your life you give and you surrender, you say, no longer for me, but for you, you will see God do great and mighty things in your life. So you, what do you want in life? What, what is this thing you want so bad? What good is it? What's greater than being close to God? What good is it if you have the, even as a pastor, you have the greatest ministry in the world. But if I'm not walking close with him, as a fr- I want to be a friend. I don't want to just be a servant. I don't just want to be someone saved. I want to be a friend to him. I want to know him. He's the one I'm going to be with forever. And I got one shot on earth here. We want to be people move with compassion, walking hand in hand and step in step with the Lord Jesus. And you can apply the blood of Jesus to your life because there's power in the blood. Man, I'm telling you, those good old songs, there is power, power. There's power in the blood of Jesus. Five areas that that I want to say real quick briefly, the blood covers. It covers yourself. It covers your family. It covers your possessions. It covers the work of his hands, your business. It covers Substance increase, in other words, influence, and even your relationships. You can apply the blood of Jesus. I remember my, my grandma, my mom's mom was here years, a few years ago, and she was flying on the airplane. She said, oh, every time I got on the airplane, I cover it with the blood of Jesus. Those people don't know they're blessed to be on the plane with me because it's going to be okay because I'm on that plane. <laughs> she said, I apply the blood of Jesus to that plane. Apply the blood of Jesus to your family, to your life. Apply the blood of Jesus. And we're going to take communion and we're going to remember the power of Jesus' blood being shed. And as you remember that, I want you to remember the covenant that God has made with you because he chose out of love to give Jesus so you can receive that blessing. And as you take the blood, remember the power of what he did. Everything is, is removed that is bad. He made a divine exchange, a divine atonement. Hey, I'll, I'll take all the bad stuff on me, give them all the good stuff. We just got to believe. And there's been a lot of lies and tradition in church that you're supposed to live this miserable, horrible life. No. There, I mean, people might persecute you. Oh, well, take a hike. They didn't die for you. Jesus died for you. And you can apply the blood. As we take communion, um, I want to encourage you to remember to apply the blood and remember what God did and believe God for your miracle. Believe God for a miracle. 